the last division to look at, the Atlantic Division 2024 NBA Draft Recap. Michael Bolton went at pick number... Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and hey, nice car. What do you do for work? Yeah, I'm in property. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Sports are slowing down, but FanDuel's still got plenty of stuff going on for you every day. All summer, they give every customer either a boost or a bonus daily, every day. That's right, every day, all summer long. Go to fanjul.com slash locked on to get started. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. So I want thumbs, I want bangs, I want bells, I want comments. Leave them down below. Coming up later today, we will do day two free agency recap, including the news on Clay Thompson, Paul George, Isaiah Hartenstein. That will come once more of those signings have rolled in. We'll probably do a day three one tomorrow as well, although it depends how many guys uh, get signed. I'm not going to be yeah, prioritizing talking about the signings of insert random player who means nothing, but we'll talk about it later. Anyway, we're here to talk about the least interesting division. Don't click out just yet. I'll try to put jokes in. Because it is the Atlantic Division, a division that just doesn't have very high draft picks. In fact, I think the highest draft pick in this entire division was pick 16. And that was the Philadelphia 76ers. And we know that he's really not going to play that much, I'm guessing. So that's okay. Bear with us as we just go through the five teams that we go through here to talk about the end of the, or the, or the other, the rest of the NBA draft, I guess, is the best way of phrasing that. Let's talk the NBA champions, Boston Celtics. I thought that they'd be looking to move off of pick number 30 for some cash and tax savings. They did not. We'll see what else they do. They've made some re-signings today in free agency. But in terms of the actual draft at number 30, they selected Baylor Shireman, who I had number 29 on my draft board from Creighton. He averaged 20.5 points, 3.5 triples, 10 rebounds, and over 4 assists per 40. They're great numbers. One steal, like he's not a very good defender. He's very much in the Dalton Connect style of defense. He is older than Connect. He does more in terms of passing. The shooting volume is really strong. I think the Celtics got themselves a very good player here, outside of the fact that he is yeah, twenty, almost 24. But when you're at pick 30, um, I think it does make sense. He could be a rotation player for them. No, not guaranteed, of course, with Pritchard and um, Sam Hauser getting a lot of those minutes coming off the bench. But there's an opportunity for Scheiman there who can do a bit with a ball in his hands and can play some spot-up stuff. The defense is a problem for sure. But I, I do I think he should have come out into the draft last year, honestly. He's a guy that did so much stuff for Creighton this last year. At 54, Anton Watson from Gonzaga. I had him at 58. Really good use of that second round pick. Watson, of course, will play zero minutes this season unless uh, a million catastrophes strike. He'll be playing for Maine. And then I guess he'll be on a two-way. Not really sure he has any impact for Boston ever. But I, I do like the value there. There's summer league signings. Xavier Johnson didn't have him ranked. Uh, Jared Lucas didn't have him ranked. And then um, Jamarion Sharp, who I did have ranked at 110. Overall, they didn't have a huge amount to work with. They're the champions. They didn't have a high pick. I like what they did at 30. I like what they did at 54. That just smacks you right bang with one Jerry West. Pretty good work, again, from Brad Stevens, but most of Brad Stevens' good work has been done in previous off-seasons, and uh, we saw the results of that. Let's talk about um, the next team, which is the only team in the NBA the team that is rebuilding, the only team in the NBA who did not have a single draft pick. The Brooklyn Nets, yes, they're going to have a lot of those picks coming in in the next few years, trading with the Nets, uh, sorry, trading with the Mavs, with the Knicks, with the Suns, but they had no picks. I thought they might have tried to do something, moving a Dorian Finney-Smith, trying to move other players to get some picks maybe, but as we know, this is not a super strong draft, so maybe you don't want to waste those bullets on getting a pick that you don't really like anyway. What they did with their, the only signings that I've seen for the Nets, which are, you know, are totally okay, Mark Armstrong, who I thought was, you know, I didn't even 79s. I thought he should have been a two-way guy. He's only signed to an exhibit 10. That's okay. Whatever. And then KJ Jones, who lists his name as KJ Jones the second. I am I'm not going to do that because I'm almost certain this is a Trey Murphy situation because his name is Kelvin Jones the second, and that's the KJ. 
I don't think he's KJ the second. Correct me if I'm wrong. He's from a very small school, uh, Emmanuel College. These guys are probably not going to do anything, but we know that this team obviously had no draft picks. They're rebuilding, so there is opportunities for undrafted free agents to find themselves in roles. And, and Armstrong's probably the more interesting one from Villanova, but yeah, we're not going to do anything. In fact, there's so little happening here with this team draft-wise that I'm not even going to give them a grade. It's no, not an Isaiah Thomas. It's not a Jerry West. It's a nothing. It's an absolute nothing grade for the Nets because, like, yeah, there's nothing happening here. Like, I, I don't know how much more I need to go into that. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Across the summer, we know the sports landscape slows down. There is still stuff happening. There's baseball. There's WNBA, PGA, NASCAR. I'm sure there's another sport that I'm missing. Oh, there's a bunch of soccer tournaments going on. NBA Summer League is starting in a week or so. And all that stuff is available. But FanDuel, in order to keep the mood buoyant, is giving something to all customers. Either a boost or a bonus every single day, all summer long. And that is not just for new customers. It's not with bonus bets. It's nothing like that. It's every single customer, every day, all through the summer. So go ahead and go to fanjul.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. Fanjul is an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Don't forget to gamble responsibly. So they're yeah, relatively less interesting teams, those first two, Boston and Brooklyn. And now we move to a team that did have a little bit more interest. They're always going to be wheeling and dealing the old New York Knickerbockers. We saw that before the draft, trading for Mikhail Bridges. But every single year, it feels like in the draft, the Knicks are trading back every time. They had picked 24 and 25, and we talked about this in every mock draft that we did saying there is no way that they keep both of these picks. Of course, they didn't. They traded 24 back to 26. Then they traded 26 out, and they made a million moves, wheeling and dealing through the second round. This is what they do. They do it every single year. They love trading back. They love trading into future years. They, they maneuver all the time. In the end, they selected more players than I thought they would. They end up with four guys. Now, of course, they're going to be in situations where they're, they're really hamstrung with, with cash issues and apron issues and tax issues because of the Bridges trade, because of the Ananobi deal and getting some guaranteed um, yeah, rookie salary players, but also some second round exception guys in is going to be important. At 25, the first round pick they did keep, it is Pacom Dadier from Ratio Farm. I had him number 30 on my board. I thought there might be a situation here where they're going to keep him overseas and save that money, but it does appear that he is going to come over. So we'll see how that um, plays out. Minutes there, are, uh, they're not going to be there. Obviously, it's Tom Thibodeau. And as much as we, we give... Thibodeau criticism for not playing young guys, and that was a real thing in the past. He is nowhere near on Doc Rivers' level, not even close to it. And in, and recently, again, I'll criticize Tom a lot for a lot of things that he does, but he has improved significantly in some of his offense in terms of three-point shooting, but also in being more more willing to play younger guys. Not always. He's not Doc Rivers refuses, and it doesn't matter what the situation, Doc will refuse. Um, Thibodeau's not like that. But they don't need Daddy A. They've obviously got DiVincenzo, Hart, Bridges, and Ananobi. If there's a position they don't need someone to play in, it is Daddy A's position, which is at the three. Paco Holmes got some decent size. He averaged 17 points, two threes, and six rebounds per 40 minutes for Ratio Farm, the house that Killian Hayes built. He averaged one and a half steals. He's just got that prototypical wing profile where he's sort of mid at all things. We hope he becomes a shooter with some good defense. It's just going to take time. And that's okay. They don't need him at the moment. At number 34, they selected Tyler Kolek as they were maneuvering around second round picks. I had Kolek much lower than others at 49. Not to say that he's not a solid player. He's fine. He's a pretty good passer. He is um, someone that I just, an, as an older point guard coming out of Marquette, I, I do worry that maybe some of the stuff that um, he was doing was largely due to the age, largely due to the you know, experience. And I won't say like advanced processing compared to others but that's basically what it is there were some that thought Colek could go in the first round maybe even to Phoenix I was not as big on that now he, he played four years in college Colek um, didn't play a senior year played only the junior year at Marquette he you can see his numbers up there or no you can't actually see his numbers on the screen so I'll tell you what his numbers are he averaged almost eight assists per game in 33 minutes he shot 39% from three and 40% from three as a sophomore so decent shooting point guard I, I just worry that there's just like a complete, a real lack of upside there. Look, he's fine. He's solid enough. I just, I just didn't see it as much as others did. But as a third string point guard behind Brunson and McBride, fine, totally reasonable, and could easily develop into a backup point guard, which is fine at that spot. No real problem with it. 
At number 56, they took Kevin McCullough Jr. I had him at 54. Now, McCullough's had uh, some knee injuries. McCullough is old as shit as well. He also can't shoot, but he's a very, very good defender. And he is just a solid uh, a solid college player who transferred across, I think, from Texas Tech to Kansas. The shooting is the real concern. And he, he's going to be playing behind DiVincenzo and Hart and all those sort of guys pretty clearly. He actually spent six years in college, which, again, is obviously a ridiculously long time. Shot 31% over his college career. He averaged four assists this season, which was a career high for him. His steal numbers are pretty strong. He's a, he, I think he's good. I think Thibodeau will like him. Really strong defensive guard who's got decent size at like 6'6". Six, six. Um, but obviously, you know, at pick 56, you're not going to get many minutes out of him. And then the last pick of the draft, which they ended up trading back with Dallas, of course they did, uh, Ariel Hakporti, a guy that, a big man who played down in Australia. He's a German Finnish player, I believe, who played in Australia last year for Melbourne United. Um, I feel like he's been around forever, but he's only 21. Coming off an Achilles tear about, I think, 18 to 20 months ago, I do think that he has got potential. They obviously lost Isaiah Hartenstein today in free agency. So at the moment, there's Mitchell Robinson as their starting center. And I'm not saying that Huck Porty is going to be in the mix straight away. That Jericho Sims probably gets the backups there, the backup role straight away. But Huck Porty is someone that I can very, very easily see developing into a uh, backup big man and yeah, outstripping a lot of other centers who were picked. Like if Huck Porty ended up better than a Dembona who went at 41 or even better than like um, uh, Daron Holmes or someone like that, I think it is possible. He can rebound, he can block shots. I, I think he's an interesting prospect to develop. There is an opening for some minutes there at some point. He's not a high usage center, with which Thibodeau is going to love. I think it's a really strong pick at 58. It's just going to take some time as he gets off that injury and gets himself back to full strength, even though he played last season. I, I really, really like that pick of Ariel Huckporty at 58. It probably amounts to absolutely nothing, but I think he deserved to be drafted, so W there. So what do we do with the Knicks after all this wheeling and dealing? I think they get one Jerry West. Solid enough draft. Daddy A, Kolek, McCullough at that spot, Huckporty, really solid. Nothing egregiously unbelievable, nothing egregiously wrong. Like it. Really good stuff from your New York Knickerbockers. That'll bring us now to talk about a team that's made most of their waves in free agency. We're going to talk about more of that later on today with uh, three to four signings, I think, that the Philadelphia 76ers have um, pulled off. We'll talk about, you know what they are, Zubre, it's Paul George, Tyrese Maxey's back. Um, We'll talk about that later on. But we're talking what they did in the draft Jared McCain went at 16. I don't know why this one felt so obvious. I mocked Jared at 16 to the Sixers. I predicted that Jared would go to 16 to the Sixers. He went at 16 to the Sixers. I had him 17 on my board. Perfect fit. Jared McCain makes people so angry, which is makes me laugh. It makes me like him even more. He is a unbelievably good shooter. Defense is a problem. I worry a little bit how the size of him and Maxi would work together. He's not going to be asked to start, would be my would be my guess this year. They've got Ubre, they've got George, they've got Maxi who are going to start. I don't really know what's going to happen at the other position, but we'll see what other things Daryl Morey's got up his sleeve. But this guy can shoot. I'm going to guess he's going to be in the rotation immediately. Three threes per 40 minutes. Only two and a half assists is a, is a weirdly low number, but six and a half rebounds, 1.4 steals playing for Duke. He's a guy that I think will probably at least live up to this spot, if not exceed it through the course of his career. We got it's all gonna it is gonna come down to the shooting and whether he just doesn't get absolutely barbecued defensively. But I do think that McCain is a strong player. I also like the Sixers getting Bona at number 41. A Dem Bona, um, a little bit of an undersized center, but aggressive, fast, um, big jumper, great athlete, good defensive player. At the moment, it does seem like the Sixers might be having to move on from Paul Reed. That is possible. They've brought Andre Drummond in to be the backup, so Bona's not really going to play very much. But he's somebody that we do need to watch his numbers in the G League. Obviously, Drummond is, what, 31 or 30 now. He's not around forever. Embiid's around the same age. They're not around forever. I think that Bona can develop into a low-end 22-minute-a-night starting center or at least an 18-minute-a-night backup. Who uh, Bona's a, a Turkish center. Again, he's six foot nine. I think there are some interesting things from him. I had him at 43. He went at 41. That's bang on the money to me. And then what they also did in the two-way market, I thought was really strong. They grabbed Justin Edwards, who was like the, the top five draft projected player at the start of this year. Highly touted recruit who did struggle at Kentucky. Although, towards the end of the season, the last stretch of the year, the shots started to come around. And while we know there is the Kentucky guard bump, like this team 
exemplifies it. Their starting point guard is the Kentucky guard bump, Tyrese Maxey, when it picked 21. Is there a Kentucky shooting guard small forward bump for Edwards? That system is, is really weird for so many different players. We saw Nick Nurse use some two-way guys last season, in particular, Ricky Council, who got converted off a two-way into a full-time contract. I'm not suggesting that Edwards is going to be able to do that immediately, but at the way things stand with the Sixers, I don't know who their starting power forward is. Maybe they finally convinced Paul George to play that spot. I don't know. I'm not saying Edwards will play there. He probably won't play much at all. But this is a situation where he could be pressed into a, a, a run for minutes. He's obviously had talent in the past. It just did not work out this season. I do worry about maybe he's not as athletic as he needs to be and maybe who knows about the shooting. But it's a great, great chance to get the two-way. And I'm almost certain that he would have been drafted had his agents not said, no, we've got a situation lined up with Philly. The other two-way guy they got was, there's never been another two-way like David Jones. I had him at number 78. I had Edwards at 59, by the way. David Jones coming across on the two-way. Pretty solid guy. I had him as listed in the two-way zone as well in my rankings at 78. Fine. Really solid. Not as exciting as the Edwards two-way signing. And it probably doesn't amount to much. But I think... After pick 16, getting Boner, Edwards, and Jones is a pretty strong hole from Daryl Morey. The exhibit 10 they signed was Max Fiedler. I did not have him ranked. Don't really have much more to say about him. Overall, this was on the high end, but it does get you one Jerry West. Not quite at two, but we get one Jerry West there for the Philadelphia 76ers. And that leaves us with one team. Some... Some may say that we are leaving the best until last, but unfortunately we're talking about Toronto, so that's very obviously not the case. That is why I had to leave the Atlantic Division to last, so I could make sure we talked about the least important team and city and country in the world right at the end here. And that's what we're doing with the Toronto Raptors, who had um, a bunch of picks due to the, or well, they lost their own pick, Al, terrible trade. They had picks from the Pacers, and then they ended up with a bunch of second-round picks. I still don't 100% understand what the Raptors' procedure is through any of these rebuilding years. I feel like they've lost a little bit of the thread. I don't mind what they did with Barnes and Quickly, even though they both could be considered marginal overpays. Probably not with Barnes Quickly marginally, but I don't mind that. I just don't know what, what else is going on here. So let's talk about what happened. At number 19... They drafted Gary Trent III, Jacoby Walter, who I just don't get. I didn't. I don't think he's terrible. I had him at number 27, but he was a volume scorer at Baylor, or not even a volume scorer, like a shooter who just couldn't hit shots. And I don't know what else he is. Like, I don't, is he Gary Trent III or is he Lonnie Walker V? That's sort of the player he is. 18.6 points and 2.7 per threes per 40 minutes, almost six rebounds, under two assists, 1.4 steals. That is just the stereotypical shooting guard who doesn't do anything else. And he's not even a high usage guy and the shooting numbers aren't, aren't good. I would guess that he plays behind Dick. I don't know whether Trent is coming back at this point. You're going to have Barnes and Quickly obviously starting. Pirtle and Alinica there. There's a lot still weird about this team. Like Walter is not going to have a good run this year. I wouldn't have thought. I know when we had Kevin Pelton on, he really did talk about how Walter came out really strong in his projections because of the volume of threes that he took. Now, he didn't hit them at a very good rate, but volume threes is important. And maybe he turns into that sort of a Malik Beasley, Gary Trent sort of a player. But the reason that Trent was able to be a fantasy option was through high steal numbers, which were inflated through Nick Nurse's system. And I don't think Walter's going to be that guy. I'm very much down on this pick. You'll be shocked to know I don't like what the Raptors did. But that is not because it's the Raptors, because I just don't like the pick. As you can see, I had Walter at 27. I, there's plenty of other guys who would have taken in this position. It could turn out okay. I'm just not sure what else Walter brings. Now, hold on to everything you've got, because I'm about to say good things. Jonathan Mogbo, I, I love them. I love him at 31. Now, the fit, whatever. He's an undersized center. He's like 6'7", I think, who can't really shoot. And probably has to play like a small ball four and five and definitely can't play next to Pirtle. Could play next to Olenek. But the numbers from him coming out of San Francisco were ridiculous. Good scoring, huge rebounds, very, very good passing. So there is something there. I had Mogbo at 28 as a first rounder. They get him at 31. That's a W. He's a, a weird sort of a player, a weird sort of a skill set. 
huge dunking, rebounding, passing, undersized center who doesn't shoot. It's a weird combo. Doesn't protect the rim, but has got really high steal numbers. I'm very interested to see how he gets used. It won't be much this season. I think there is... I don't think he's ever going to become any sort of a shooter, which probably limits what he can do. And the size is a problem, but he just can play. And I'm very excited to see what he's going to bring. And I think Raptors fans yeah, have a level of... Um, calm on a level of um yeah let's let's keep the expectations low but i think he's a really interesting option there at number 45 they picked jamal shed in a pick they got from the kings as part of taking on sasha vizenkov and davion mitchell i'm not as big on shed as others were jamal shed watch him in college and you think it's great he shot the ball well he generates a lot of steals really strong defender and that is all true he was very very good playing for houston in college looked great as a college point guard the man is too small. This is this is what my problem is. Is that all worked well in college? He's like smaller than Marcus Sasser. I think he's six foot, six six and a half foot and a half without shoes. I don't know whether those steel numbers work in the NBA. Are people just going to be like, you know, popping him on their head and shooting over him? Maybe. Will his shot work? Will he get it off? Can he ever be a full time point guard? I honestly don't know. This happened a lot in the second round where a lot of these 23, 24-year-old guys with significant flaws were going where other guys with more upside seemed to slip through, like a Jalen Bridges, a Justin Edwards, for example, and ended up finding their ways, Trey Alexander, onto teams with two ways. And I think a lot of that was by design. No problem with Shed at all. It's going to be interesting that the player that I thought he was more likely to be comparable to was Davion Mitchell, and now they're on the same team. But with Mitchell there, with Quickly there, Shed's not going to be playing that much. He could be an interesting fantasy guy if the shot is real because the steal numbers were very interesting. And that is always something we look at, whether a player can be a good NBA player. Does he have a good steal rate? That is that is interesting. But I just fear that he's too small to have any sort of an impact because he's not like a dynamic offensive player. He's good defensively, but I don't know that that works necessarily at that level. But it's almost impo- How do I criticize at 45? Like, it's not a bad pick. It's fine. What I did love was them taking the flyer, and this is complete peak Masai Ujiri. At number 57, my man Ulrich Chomchi, who we don't really have much to go on. Chomchi only started playing um, basketball a few years ago, comes from the NBA Academy in Africa out of Cameroon. He's six foot 11. He takes threes, he makes threes, he rebounds, he blocks shots. He also looks lost, which you'd understand when you never played before and you're in a, a different environment. And it's really hard to sort of be able to judge players coming out of that environment. I think I would have had taken a flyer at him at the start of the second round, Chomchi. I've even had him in the first round at times. I had him at 33 on my board. This a six foot eleven guy who's still 18, doesn't turn 19 until December. This is a long-term play. You put him on like a two-year two-way. You see what happens. You give some opportunities there. Um, I think the shooting might be interesting, and that would enable him to be able to fit really well alongside Scotty Barnes if that is, in fact, something. I keep forgetting they got RJ Barrett too. But if that shooting does turn into a real stretch big who can rebound and block shots, that becomes really interesting. And it might turn into absolutely nothing. But I love the pick of Shamshi at number 57. The two-way guy was Brandon Carlson, who I had at 109. So at least I had him ranked, but like, yeah, whatever. I don't think he's going to be an impact player. Um, Exhibit 10, they signed... Quincy Guerrier, who I don't have ranked and I don't know anything about. They had some summer league signings as well. Probably the team that signed the most guys, at least on the list that I've got. They um, brought in Medea uh, on a summer league contract. I didn't have Tyler Perry ranked anywhere. Um, Joseph Gerard, the third ripping name. I had him 123rd. Uh, Jamison Battle, I had at 91. Did they bring him on a summer league deal? And the one I really like is Dylan Disu out of Texas. I had him at 70. I thought he should have been a two-way guy. At the moment, he's only on a summer league deal. The Raptors are really pretty good usually at looking at guys who do well in summer league and immediately trying to grab contracts for them. They did it with Terrence Davis. They did it with Javon Freeman Liberty last season as well. Not that those guys have 100% worked out, but Davis was able to be an NBA rotation player. Freeman Liberty started games this year. I wouldn't be shocked if they look to Disu and say, look, hey, do some stuff in summer league and we'll give you a two-way immediately. I think he's the one to really pay attention to there. Overall, Masai Ujiri, Bobby Webster, as the Raptors fans, I'm sure, will be quick to point out, oh, it's not actually Masai. Bobby Webster, I didn't love the Walter pick. I liked most of the other stuff. Overall, one Jerry West. So overall, solid stuff from this division, which obviously is the least exciting division draft-wise in the NBA. That's why we left it to last. And that brings us to the end of the draft recap stuff. More free agency shows coming today and a bunch of other stuff is in the works. Guys, hit that thumbs up, hit the um, like button, hit the subscribe, and you'll never miss an episode because you never know what's coming out. Guys, we are done here. 
Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.